I'm now going to introduce Dr. John Thompson, who is the founder and CEO of Extract Lab. And he's going to be presenting today on what is the endocannabinoid system. And from one medical professional to another medical professional, I think this topic is extremely important. And I still joke around because back in 1998, when I looked at my anatomy and pathology book, I saw there highlighted the endocannabinoid system. I can see Dr. John Thompson already in the corner of my screen laughing when I say that as well too. So, so Dr. John Thompson, optimizing global success in cannabis. Dr. John Thompson is a separation scientist, entrepreneur, but also an inventor. As a CEO that is also a scientist, he brings a unique analytical perspective to everything that he does. Whether it's inventing new technology or building a business, he has a strong technical background in analytical instrumentation, biotech, mining, and homeland security markets. During his cannabis career, Dr. Thompson has a strong record of helping companies set up hemp, adult use, and medical cannabis extraction and processing facilities. Dr. Thompson has assisted in, in hundreds of companies to attain their goals in cannabis and hemp extraction and manufacturing, as well as a market development, strategic marketing, and worldwide business-to-business -business alliance formation. But he also does international markets too. And for everyone on this, on this event today, pay attention. It's really important to be able to do work both domestically and internationally. Dr. Thompson has received a bachelor's of science degree um, in biochemistry, has received a master's of science degree in chemistry and a doctor of, chem uh, doctor of chemistry degree all from the University of Minnesota. Dr. Thompson, thank you for being here today. The floor is yours. I'm gonna unmute here. How are you guys doing? Uh, good, good to see you all. Um, there's a small echo here. Let me just kind of gonna make that happen. Okay, I think we're all set. So, all right. Um, welcome to everybody here. Uh, appreciate you joining us. Um, today, we're going to be talking about optimizing your investment, optimizing your business for investment. We're going to be talking a little bit about, um, you know, my experience uh, and where we really um, have invested in the cannabis space, and maybe it'll be uh, somewhat of an inspiration to you guys. Um, there, one thing about this market that's so great is there's so much opportunities for everybody. Um, you're talking about a market that's growing at 20% uh, compound annual growth rate, plus um, there are any number of ways to make money. Um, and I, I've already reviewed some of the um, details from some of the presenting companies. I'm very interested to hear more from the owners and the founders of those companies. Um, just exciting amounts of work. And, and you know, what we do, uh, we actually have put hundreds and hundreds of people into the business of either hemp processing or hemp um, or, and or cannabis processing and uh, has spent a lot of time uh, dealing with those types of customers, um, getting them up and running from basically starting with nothing, whether it be a farmer or a... Um, you know, or a processor, whether they're a GMP provider or not, we've literally put hundreds of people in the business. And as a consequence of that, um, we have spent a lot of time reviewing their business plans. We've learned a lot about how to help them along. Um, sometimes um, talk them out of doing the business altogether um, because they, they just weren't ready or they just didn't have the right business plan associated with it. Um, so I'm just going to, um, first of all, give you a background on, on my business. I'm in the ancillary business. Um, and let me kind of just pull up a, um, a presentation here. Okay, there we are. So the title of the talk is really optimizing your business or optimizing your investment or optimizing your uh, investment portfolio for, for success. Um, I'm going to speak to all three of those topics, in fact. Um, and, you know, one of the interesting, uh, interesting things, when I, when I was in 2014, when I first gave my first pitch to some investors, um, I really started talking about selling picks and shovels to the people who are going to be building the industry. 
And, um, you know, it, it was uh, at the time, I, it was a 15 minute presentation. It was really quick. Um, and we started our ancillary business, uh, basically focused on equipment supplies, consulting and consumables for the botanical extracts market. I'm gonna go over to you, with you, what our successes were there. I'm gonna talk about some of the profitable sectors within that ancillary market. Um, also, our views on, on market trends, what we see in the market taking place. Um, and then I'll give you some three keys for optimizing your investment along with some recommended resources that we'll, we'll plug for you there. So what is it that we do? Um, you know, a lot of companies are out there, they're looking for ways to make their business model work. What we do is we en enable companies to really purify and produce active ingredients. Um, and those can be botanical active ingredients, they can be pharmaceutical act active ingredients. Um, and a lot of times the customers that we deal with, they don't really have, um, some of them have the technical background, some of them do not. Some of them have the business background. Um, and, and sometimes we can put technical and business people together to really make it work for them. So um, we enable in unique combinations of aromas and flavors with our technology. We apply technology and we were able to, for example, enable um, the formulations and proprietary blends that people then bring out into the marketplace. Um, we enable derivatives and purified extracts. And here are just some in, uh, examples, uh, you know, aloe vera, mint, uh, batswilia, arnica flower, and many, many others, uh, really botanical extracts that are used in some sort of phyto um, medicinal compounds or phytonutrients or phyto ingredients that are then brought out into the marketplace. And what's wonderful about this is that we do this from an equipment uh, consulting and consumable standpoint. And that's how we really serve the market. So um, we're really there to apply science. Um, that's been the very foundation of our company. And by the way, it should be the foundation of your company as well. Um, you wanna make sure that you are applying the right science in the right place in the right time. So when you're thinking about um, uh, you know, how you're gonna really um, conduct your business, science is the number one thing. And what that will allow you to do is create proprietary solutions, proprietary, um, you know, proprietary mixes, proprietary um, designs that then go out into the marketplace. People pay for proprietary things, um, whether that be on a, a unique design or a unique formula. Um, they they want something that's unique. They don't want something like everybody else is doing. So. Um, here's just an example of some of the brands that we've put out in the past couple of years. Um, um, and we started originally with our flagship extract lab brand. That's our extractor brand. And uh, since that time, we put out many different equipment brands and also uh, consumables. We have software in there, like I said, um, medical packaging and drug delivery also with, um, you know, from the standpoint of, um, you know, consulting getting people up and running on, on um, their GMP um, protocols. And these are things that are required by uh, compliancy markets. So, um, you know, we really help people, you know, succeed. Um, we've done a lot in terms of um, making sure that we uh, invest in the science. From those of you who are out there just starting your companies, um, you know, if you're starting from an engineering background, you want to make sure you have that science down, but then make investments in the business side and vice versa. If you're a scientist startup type of person and you um, feel that you're going to go out to market, you really need to have that uh, business background or a business partner there to, to really focus on, um, you know, for example, raising money or focus on the financials. Um, you know, you're going to need audited financials if you really want to go public or anything like that. So these are the things that those uh, people are going to help you to do. So, um, like I said, we've been very, very successful. Um, we're probably one of the very few ancillary companies that are out there that are actually profitable. Um, for example, we, we drove almost $7 million to the bottom line here in the trailing uh, months. Um, these are some of the awards that we have on the very bottom. We, we achieved uh, uh, 204 on the Inc. 5000 list uh, with a 2,140% growth. And you can see we've been building up really slowly. Um, it took a lot of work to do that. I know no, uh, you guys who are just starting your companies, um, you're just starting them. And, and you know, we bootstrapped this whole thing. Um, very, very difficult to do. Um, always 
clamoring for cash, for working capital. Um, when you're growing that much, how do you really make that work? Um, so something you need to think about is um, making sure that you have enough working capital so that you can actually deliver the products that you are about to you know, deliver to the rest of the world. It's important also that along the way you make investments in certifications and whether or not uh, that's a certification for say a childproof packaging certification, if you're in the consumer side, a clean label is a really big deal these days. Consumers are demanding um, you know, higher, cleaner ingredients, higher quality ingredients that are naturally derived. Um, you know, obtaining organic certifications. These are the things that um, your customers are gonna like and in turn, they're going to uh, reward you with more sales, um, which always is going to drive more to the bottom line. Um, here's an example. We actually operate in two different facilities that are about uh, 10 miles away from each other. We have a, a, a large manufacturing facility. It's a, a welding shop, and uh, uh, we have a whole bunch of certifications, ISO 9000 certification. But one of the things that really makes us unique among other, other companies is that we have a 68,000 actually operating GMP certified application center. Um, that's really interesting because we have a full on laboratory. Our customers can come here and they can see it. Um, and anybody listening to this who wants to learn about how um, you know, processing really takes place, you're welcome to come and visit us um, and uh, look at our materials that we have on the web. We have a tremendous amount of uh, learning materials, including many courses. So I wanted to kind of go over what, what I, how I really look at the ancillary market. Um, back when I was working for corporate America, we would always uh, make these, what we called strategy maps. It was kind of a big thing back then in the 90s. Um, and really what you would do is you would, you would lay out a, a process and then you would look where you're playing and then you'd look upstream and downstream and that would allow you to either formulate an acquisition strategy or formulate a product strategy or something like that so that you can acquire in the, in the proper amounts of, in the proper places. And what you see on the, on the map here is, is how we uh, typically look at the uh, botanical extracts market. You can see here, we're, uh, we're really not looking at the growing side at all. Um, but we look at uh, you know, how, the, how the products are made once the um, biomass is grown. And when I say biomass, I'm not talking only about cannabis. I'm not talking only about hemp. Um, that's very limiting uh, to, to a marketplace. You, you need to think about the total uh, biosphere, if you will, um, because uh, there's a lot of different uh, compounds, botanicals that have um, an effect actually on the endocannabinoid system. And you can use those in their botanical extracts that have nothing to do with hemp, for example, or ha even have nothing to do with cannabis. So um, open your mind on, on your target market. Um, so, but we're in this picks and shovels and you can see that means lab services, lab equipment, excipients, uh, packaging, manufacturing equipment. You can see that as you go through this process, um, you know, you can see that there's potency testing. That's where all the quality equipment is. You can imagine there's lots of consumables associated with that. If you go all the way to the bottom with the end products, that's where you're talking about, um, you know, that's where all the excipients are. are. Um, that's where all the packaging is. Um, that's where all of the, you know, the brands are really sitting there in that end products world. Um, and that's where, you know, both, that can also be a very lucrative area to play. Um, if you're not, if you're actually produced, producing the, the packaging yourself, as opposed to um, just distributing it. Um, so yeah, there's a whole bunch of different ways. We, we operate in uh, pre-processing, extraction, post-processing, and end products. So we've been building, we first started off with the Extract Lab Extractor, which is right there in the middle. And then we went upstream and downstream. So, um, and interestingly enough, we're um, getting heavily into the end product side of this with medical packaging and uh, medical formulations and unique excipients. So uh, this is an example of you know, the typical process that someone would go through in an ancillary way. They'd, they'd wanna move from the left hand to the right hand side into a higher degree of purity, potency, and identity. And you can see what we did and how we did it was we said, okay, we looked at the value, value chain and we said, okay, well, we're gonna start here and then we're gonna innovate upstream and downstream of that. I encourage you to, when you're making your 
uh, presentations and your pitches um, to, uh, you know, when you have more time to go through it with an investor, it's always good to make up some sort of strategy map saying, hey, this is what the market really looks like. Here's where we're playing. And here's how, here's a picture of really what it looks like. So, um, you know, like I was saying, when we doing that and following that strategy, um, along with a market strategy, which was focusing on um, you know, botanicals, we really had a really great success. Um, right now we're right around 25 million in sales. Uh, we have a very nice EBITDA uh, bottom line of about seven and uh, this year we'll be doing very, very well as well. This is some examples, some customers that we put together. You can see this, uh, this is the people actually using, um, you know, either consulting services that we have or buildings that we put together. It's, 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 it's really exciting to see it all come together. So. Let me give you some um, probably more unique uh, aspects on what I see as the market trends. Um, you know, one of the things that we've seen from our customer base and from people who want to get in, the entrepreneurs, um, the, you know, they're really looking at, you know, uh, the public and private bureaucracy in a lot of cases really circumvented the ability for them to access the market. That's from the SBA side, the DEA side, the FDA side, the national banks, and worse of, worse of all, the, um, the private, um, in other words, the private companies like Amazon, uh, Facebook, Yahoo, Google, Bing, you know, it's very difficult for them to, for example, take a hemp product or a cannabis product they can't really uh, advertise. So they're really spending a lot of time trying to struggling against the entire machinery, the bureaucracy against them. So that, that really is not changed. And, and Ostensibly, they're saying that that's going to change. So when that does happen, we, we ought to see an explosion of, first of all, not only marketing of people who are waiting in the sidelines, but also just an explosion in terms of the packaging and, and all of the ancillary businesses going way up. So um, banking reform is, is number one. I'm very looking, very, uh, looking forward to it. It's going to give um, so ostensibly access to capital markets from a lot of our customers. Um, they're really not able to access them. Um, and it possibly will end that internal bureaucratic war on the legal hemp and marijuana markets, which would be really great. It would enable that. So um, the law which took uh, and enabled uh, freedom within the market, the bureaucracy basically took away. So we really like to see that kind of regulation relaxed. Um, and then um, MJ reform uh, will not change the laws in other countries. So that's something to note. Those of you who are investors and those of you who are investing, um, you know, there's, there still are other laws. For example, CBD, which is in the U.S., um, you know, you can, you can move it across state lines. It's not considered a pharmaceutical drug. In Canada, it's still considered a pharmaceutical drug. In Europe, we have novel food um, regulations that are taking place. Um, and there's, uh, depending on the company that you're dealing with, there's lots of different types of regulations. So you need to be cognizant and aware of that as you make up your business plans. Um, but uh, the fundamentals of the market are still there. They're still looking at pretty good, uh, market growth, which is really great. You still have the main drivers as I see them. Um, one of the things that people really use like uh, the endocannabinoid botanical systems for is to reduce or eliminate uh, maybe opioids uh, for, for pain purposes. So um, that's something that is a key driver in the marketplace. I think at a key adoption driver, um, increased demand for natural ingredients is more of a general thing, um, you know, clean label, um, you know, when you get to the point where you can sell to, for example, Whole Foods or a Kroger's grocery or whatever, they're going to be putting clean label requirements on you and things like that. And then still yet, there's lots of fragmentation in the market. Everybody knows this. They see it. A lot of small players. It's, it's regulated. And oftentimes the regulations are insurmountable. It's also fast moving. So one of those things where, um, you know, if you have products that you can really look at uh, over time, it's pretty good uh, to continuously um, put out new products, especially on a consumer side. So just to go over this very quickly, growers, processors, manufacturers, and brands, um, you got to understand where you sit in that eco space, where you sit. Those, these are our customers, but from the standpoint of an, uh, you know, looking at who your customers are, you really got to know your customers. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what the profitable sectors are in the ancillary equipment. 
Um, the first one is proprietary equipment. Um, if you look at some of the uh, equipment purveyors that are out there that are servicing the extractor uh, and also the uh, ancillary equipment markets, they're, they're pretty profitable. Um, they have good uh, margins, they have great EBITDAs. Um, you know, and so they're, they're not really uh, pulling a lot of negative uh, EBITDA numbers. Um, a lot of them are private, for example, the second one would be the laboratory and uh, GMP services market. Those are the laboratory services market. Those are typically pretty profitable. You know, it's a fee for service type of work. Um, there's lots of labs that have been uh, popping up in this industry. Uh, some of them good, some of them not so good. Um, but it's important to know that those, those laboratories and those services, since they're required and needed, um, with the right marketing plan, they really can be very profitable um, and um, you know, we have a laboratory here. We don't do other people's samples with it, but um, you know, it's very important that you have as a part of your workflow. For example, if you're if you're running a, a manufacturing facility, that you have those uh, quality control, quality assurance uh, aspects to your business. So, uh, and then unique and proprietary packaging focused on compliance and fashion. Okay, so this is something where um, you know distributor models for packaging and things like that. They they're typically very low, very low margin. Um, but if you can, for example, make your own packaging with your own molds um, and uh, make those very um, fashionable so that they become um, something where, you know, you're, you're talking about better margins, like a 40, 50, even 50% gross margin, then you really have a good business. So um, those are, there's lots of opportunities for that. And, um, and I think that you'll be seeing a lot more unique packaging people who are going to invest in tooling and things like that to really um, produce some, you know, even medical grade packaging. So that's, that's all in store. So I'm just gonna give you a couple keys for investment in your company. Um, this is for investors and for those who are, uh, you know, trying to get people to invest in the company. Just some three keys from everybody that I talked to. Um, maximize liquidity of your investment. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm going to talk just slightly about debt and then for criteria that we use to assess a client's business plan. It's really important that when you raise money, you have um, liquidity in mind. Your investor is going to want to um, have his, um, he's going to want to understand where his exit money is going to come from. Where is he going to make money in the situation? A um, couple ways to do that. You can just, you know, for example, sell him the majority control, and then he can decide whatever he wants to do with it. He can take it public. Um, he can, um, you know, decide what he wants to do with the um, EBITDA that's generated from, from sales. Um, so that is one way to do it. And you're there. You'll, you'll obviously be a minority um, shareholder, but that is actually a, a very good way to do it. Um, cash is still king. In every business, it always has been that way through all of millennia. And so oftentimes, if you can get someone to take your business over and you can work for them, that, that's probably a really good option. Um, and um, then also um, preferential payout on earnings. Sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't. Um, most investors, from what I know, don't, don't buy that um, because there's always a need for EBIT. Um, and there's always a need for more working capital. So it turns out that, you know, EBIT is not really distributed or, um, you know, the distributions are very far, few and far between. So um, the investor is not too keen on that typically. Um, the other way to do it is to, to engage in a registered or unregistered public offering that results in freely traded shares. Um, something that we are looking at um, for our company very closely is the Regulation A. Um, this is for companies that are, um, that are, you know, maybe in the 20 to, you know, maybe 10 to $20 million. They're looking to really grow out. Um, you know, you can have a public offering of 20 to 75 million, uh, depending on the tier. It's fully tradable shares upon closing. They're exempt from regulation uh, or registration, excuse me. Um, so lots of really great benefits. I think that, um, you know, you can talk to your investment advisor and really understand, hey, um, you know, what are the different options for, um, it's for, for a public offering? It's not just an IPO. Um, there's ways you can do it um, by combining an RTO um, and, and this regulation A and really doing a, a great job at going and, and looking at the market. So one of the interesting things about this particular um, 
regulation is that you're able to test the waters with uh, offerings ahead of time with those who will listen. So um, you can kind of pretest the waters without having to, um, you know, be really um, restricted in what you say. Um, a lot of times in a typical IPO, um, you would have a very restricted amount of time. So also it allows you to crowdfund. So um, there's other pipe, Reg D, Reg S, back IPO. Uh, just suffice it to say that that is a, there's a lot of really good options for you guys. You should talk to an investment advisor. Um, if, you, Thompson, if you have, you um, especially if you left. have um, sales with EBIT, um, which means profit, a profitable sales. Um, if you have target acquisitions, if you have an aggressive growth plan, if you have ongoing need for capital, these are all reasons why you would want to consider going public. So now I'm just going to talk quickly about debt. Um, every every Thompson, person that you talk to is going to... You got, you got about 45 seconds left, Dr. Thompson. 45 seconds? Yep. Okay, so every person that you're going to talk to um, about uh, debt, you've got a really... Um, really an important thing there uh, to, to, to look at. So um, banking is not really a viable option for marijuana companies. Um, banks often confuse MJ with hemp. So keep that in mind. Um, a lot of times people have a hard time getting debt for their companies. And PPP loans are a unique investment risk now, unfortunately. So anybody who's received a PPP loan, um, that's a real issue. So think about that when you're talking about it. So. Um, to close up here, um, there are a couple qualifications that we use, typical qualification questions that we use to determine if your business plan is viable. Do you have assets? Do you have a license? And most importantly, where are your customers? You should identify those up ahead of time. And do you have money for working capital? So um, also today is, is in a kind of very uh, distressed environment in terms of companies that are out on the marketplace. So people are looking around for deals. Um, they're going to lowball your company probably on valuation. Um, and if you did well in 2020, they're going to discount that. If you did do so well, they, won't, they, they want to count that. So um, my advice is don't waste a lot of time with national banks either um, because you're going to have a lot of problems. Um, they're not going to fund you probably. So I, I, there's a lot of brokers and people out there that are um, saying that they can do it, but it's very, very difficult to do. Um, so that having All been right. said, here's some resources okay. for you guys. If you want to learn more about, um, you know, the marketplace, we have a tremendous amount of mini courses and guides and calculators and podcasts. I hope you guys found it uh, interesting. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson. Very, very informative. Uh, one thing I, I always recommend Dr. Thompson after the, after you're done talking you can just put uh, your key contact information or your LinkedIn, uh, whatever the best way to contact you in the chat room. That'd be great for everyone here listening. And Dr. Thompson has some really great points with investors and some really great points also with exit strategies. Um, definitely a, a ball of knowledge. So thank you again. I really do appreciate that. Um, our next speaker is going to be talking about what is the outlook for raising capital in 2021. And the person that's gonna be leading that discussion is going to be Matt Norgren. And Matt has a very great and, and unique background. I'm very proud to say I've been an investor judge with uh, Matt Nor Norgren several times. I've actually met with uh, other people that he, he's actually mentored as well too in the industry. <clears throat> so John really is, I'm sorry, Matt is really uh, uh, someone that you really wanna pay attention to. So with that being said, uh, Matt Norgren is actually the, currently the CEO and co-founder of Arcadian Fund and Arcadian Capital Management, which is a venture capital slash private e equity strategy focused on ancillary services providing companies in and around cannabis and the hemp industry. Some unique facts about uh, Matt is he actually received his education from the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, he also played football at uh, the University of Texas for the Texas Longhorns, and he was a quarterback on the national championship winning team. Um, and what's really cool and unique about Matt is that he was able to actually take a lot of those skills that he learned and developed uh, out while at the University of Texas, and he was able to implement that throughout his lifetime and also into his core business philosophies. 
while playing football on a scholarship at the University of Texas. Matt, he's also a very smart man too. He not only graduated with one, but with two degrees within four years and was also accepted into and pursued a master's degree at the University of Texas. Matt had the pleasure and the honor to actually play professionally for the Detroit Lions, as well as the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, which is the, part of the National Football League. Mr. Uh, Norgren went on to earn a dual master's degree in both business administration and sports management from the University of Dallas. From his time doing that, Matt uh, was featured on the Bravo TV show, Most Eligible, Dal Most Eligible Dallas. If you remember that TV show, Matt was on that. And while, while that happened, saw he actually- that, David. Well, wow, you don't you don't know that part. You know what? You you, you oh, throw it in oh, there, yeah. but Matt, let me just give you the <laughs> let, me, let me give you this last paragraph because I don't want to underestimate you. The most important thing is this: is that Matt has been appointed to many executive leadership positions with a wide ranging group of companies and industries, from real estate to sports entertainment, from hospitality to insurance and financial services. Matt truly is a pioneer and is a is a unique leader in emerging mm -hmm. industries to later stage leverage buyouts. He's really focused on finding synergistic opportunities in early stage private growth rounds that have upside potential. Everyone, as someone who I've learned always something from Matt, each time I hear him speak, thank you for being here today. The floor is yours, sir. Well, hey, thanks, David. I, you know, hang around too, man. We can um, talk through things you think are important. There's, it seems like a lot of folks are on here. So, you know, really glad to uh, have the opportunity to share some of our thoughts. Uh, that introduction makes you feel old, but those of us in the cannabis industry, I think, you know, but you hear people talk about it like dog years. It, it feels like seven years per year. And, and just because of all the things that happen and how, how quickly things change. And for those of you and those of us that can solve that problem and continue to pivot and grow with it, uh, you're able to build a real nice barrier to entry because those institutionals that are starting to look at this today, and let me just tell you, the conversation has changed. It's changed definitely. It definitely changed after uh, January 6th. Uh, and then in the South, they needed to see a little more. And after um, you know Biden took office, it was, it, was, it was apparent to the institutionals. The conversation changed. We had been you know, um, fighting that battle for many, many, many years. The reason we built Arcadia in the way we did, um, you know, was to essentially be able to be, call it an Andreessen Horowitz of the botanical wellness space. But, but ultimately, you know that to, to, to break down glass ceilings and, and open up uh, the industry's resources to uh, these large institutionals, you have to check a certain amount of boxes. And, um, you know, we really wanted to keep our eyes focused on the ancillary market because we know that if you can prove performance and build multiple funds and have exits, that there is, um, if timed right, uh, the ability maybe to access institutional capital that is very, very, very large. And frankly, we feel like we have a responsibility to the industry to do that. Um, and we're only as good as the companies that we invest in are. And so... Uh, you know, fortunately, these companies are really good right now. 62% growth last year. Are you kidding me? This is, these are, this is, you know, people keep asking all these questions. What's going to be driving the market? Safe Banking Act now and this and that. And how about quarterly earnings? Okay. And those aren't going to stop. And now Mexico's in. Uh, fully and a lot to tell you about there. Um, can't go into great detail, uh, but some really exciting things are happening in that market. And so, you know, potentially with, uh, I don't know, you could argue we're still in a bull market. I mean, even through coronavirus, to be frank, uh, is there a bear to come? I don't know. It's the longest cycle ever, probably. Can interest rates be like this always? I don't know. Are tech companies a little bit overvalued? I mean, if you take the top five to seven companies out of the equation last year, the FANG stocks, most people's, you know, major, the major allocators returns are more like 7%. Just with five or seven companies taken out. And then if you go a little deeper and take the top 30 companies out from a return standpoint last year, most allocators on average are going to be in the negative. And so it, there, there really is a bear there. And these top seven companies can't quite possibly do what 
it, it looks like. And so I think when you see markets start to change on top of the fact that cannabis is this commodity-like uh, industry that has tech and biotech type returns, I mean, how often does that happen? Um, so uh, the, the cash that these large, you know, multi-state operators are generating, uh, the companies that service them, uh, the strength of this category and, and servicing this category, the complexity of it, you know, the, the barrier to entry that we talked about earlier. It's, it's just getting really exciting. So, so Matt, let me ask you a question just because it's really hot for the last few days and you may not have an answer, but I think a lot of people want to hear your response. So um, for the outlook for raising capital, what do you think the effect of the PACT Act is going to have on the industry? Um, and for those that aren't familiar, the PACT Act is the one saying that you, uh, the United States Postal Service can't uh, send anything in the mail with the vaporizer products, e-cigs, and, and it has some people concerned about that. And there's still a lot of gray area, and I know it's very raw, Matt, but you know, as someone who invests, as someone myself who invests, you know, how do you think that's going to really change the outlook for the next maybe three to six months with, uh, with, the, with that? Yeah, see, the trend is so big, though. Think about um, the cannabis industry is probably the greatest uh, opportunity in the history of consumer ingredients. It, it, potentially, it's the most dynamic, the most complex, um, and at the molecular level, the most interesting, you know, for, 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 for what human beings need at the cellular level. So, you know, I, I could argue that if you think about the direction this industry is moving and you look at GW Pharma with just a few FDA approved drugs uh, sell themselves for what 7.7 .7 billion to Jazz Pharmaceuticals the other day. Uh, if, you, if you've got biotech IP and you're in phase two clinical work and getting into phase three and you're about to come and replace opioids, there is a part of this industry as an ingredient set uh, that is so big happening that does it matter if the Postal Service can't send vape pens? I mean, th there's so many tailwinds and so many categories. Can we, um, you know, be better uh, served to understand some of the things and the more the road bumps that'll happen? Yeah. And for the last 10 years, we've all been doing this. They continue to come, but we just keep going right over them. And, and it's because it's so strong in so many areas, uh, the byproducts from hemp, you know, a half a Home Depot in 10 years will probably be hemp fiber somewhere. Um, you know, so do, do they care about it? All these things are important, but what we have to understand is the big picture and the big picture is so strong. Um, as long as particularly with the change in the markets may happen ahead, this industry is gonna become increasingly more interesting um, for, for allocators that are trying to balance uh, a portfolio in that environment, looking into their alternatives, generating some extra yield. So um, yeah, I, I, we can, you know, let's stay focused uh, on the big picture, but obviously the little things are gonna be uh, issues we're gonna have to deal with. And, and I appreciate you saying that, Matt. Um, we've been telling our own clients and our own investors to calm down and remember the bigger picture. And, you know, the, the ball's rolling and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And even if, as you just said too, it's about the bigger picture and looking past the hood of the car. So I really appreciate you saying that. So thank you. Still there, Matt? <laughs> yeah, I was here. I was seeing if you were going to throw a quite throw a direction. Oh, I, I, Come on, no, man. no, I was just saying that I, th I think it was just really good that, that you brought that part about the pack about, about yeah. the bigger picture. So what's important for this, for the, for the crowd, I see friends here, John. And so I, I think for the crowd is this, and I think what most people looking at the questions is the following you as an investor and you think about the bigger picture, what are the top two or three items or, or objective points a, a, a company should think about before approaching an investor? Well, first and foremost, Try to understand who it is you're talking to. Nothing drives an investor more crazy than if you figure out how to get into a conversation about, you know, um, educating an investor on the story and then only to realize that you don't even come close to meeting the mandates of what they're trying to do. Instead, you know, it's hard enough to get that call. So make sure when you get on the phone and you're having conversations with people that may could provide you resources 
that you do as, as, as good a job as you can to understand who they are, uh, what position they may be in, um, you know, uh, so that will give you an advantage because then you can speak to the, the most likely scenario for you guys to align. If this is a late stage growth equity investor, for example, I mean, you're looking them up and you can get information to see they're doing these big, you know, late stage equity deals. Then you go into the conversation and say, hey, I'm glad to be on the phone with you. From what I can tell, we might be a little bit early, but maybe not. I mean, maybe you, but you know, we love the type of stuff you're doing. We see this deal that you did. What were you thinking there? You know, and, and then here's how we fit in and could. And so I think that's th something that I really want to want to make an emphasis on is just doing the extra work. We do that as, you know, fund managers. We have to have an investments team that takes these things in and, and gets the information uh, in front of us so we can be clearly, uh, you know, following protocols, but understanding like how we can bring value. What's this conversation about? Because we just don't get on the phone you know, preparation. Uh, so you ask for three things, preparation, execution, integrity. Um, you know, you got to prepare for anything in life. It doesn't matter what it is. Like if you want to achieve something, you don't just start, you have to prepare. And so preparation is one and then execution. I mean, um, you, you know, you've just, you've got to see things through all the way to the end. And then I think the one that a lot of people don't talk about, but something we look for and there's ways of doing it, uh, but integrity, uh, because it's just not worth doing business with people that, uh, <laughs> you know, are going to make things not fun because this is so <laughs> much fun. We'd rather not do business and make money with someone. There's too many places to make that happen now. And so uh, integrity. And, and I'm, I'm really happy you said integrity because everyone here listening, especially if you're new to the industry is that, this industry is small and someone like Matt, who's been in for a while, you mentioned like the dog years and, you know, it seems like we've been in for a very long time is that if you don't have that right, good business ethics, you don't have that right integrity, people are not going to want to work with you and that will spread around. And a great example is there's a deal that was brought to us that was turned on by two other people. And we were new about it ahead of time because of, of a pain and, and said, uh, how much of a pain in the butt they were and how they really didn't have good business eth ethics. And, I'm going to, I'll take another step on what Matt said. And Matt, I'd love to hear your feedback on this. And we have about eight minutes left. You talked about preparation. You talked about how, hey, you're not going to get on the phone right away. So in your opinion, um, would you recommend people having like a one-page executive summary or like a one-page teaser to send that out to people to look at first to, to even draw interest first? Or Yeah, what, I think what, so. I think so because, you know, like anything in life, um, the more you only say what needs to be said means that you are re listening more and you're receiving more um, data. And so, uh, you know, in an emerging industry, a manager uh, is, if he's doing it right, and I can just tell you how we think, and by the way, there are 10 or 15 or 20 really great funds in this space, and this is how we all think. And, and that's to say that you want to be in have an insatiable appetite for for information and so we want to see everything in the industry because it allows us to help put the industry together i mean we're we're all interested in this whole thing working and and particularly being ahead of uh regulators such that we have this thing tied up and we have strength in the way that it needs to um you know benefit the people that got it here so uh i give us a one pager because you know, we, we, we as managers are not, we're not trying to say no, you know, in a lot of industries, if you get to someplace that's an investor, the first step is going to be with somebody whose job is to say no. If you even get a response, they're just <laughs> so well said, <laughs> right? But I think in our industry, it's a little bit different. I, I, my team, I can promise you, we want to chew on every single piece of data that we can. It doesn't matter what it is. And so not to leverage companies against each other. I mean, look, for example, we're investors in BDS analytics and headset. The fact that you can invest in the two leading data companies in this space speaks to your character. They understand that we use information properly and only for the benefit of everybody. And so if you give us just the information that we need, okay, we want to understand the business. And we're thinking about it, you know, how, how does this whole thing work together? How does our ecosystem of companies 
uh, uh, benefit your business. We, we, it's for us to understand you more concisely. And so I think just don't be afraid to be whoever you are. There's only upside. So just be, uh, be the business you are, present you know, the information in a very concise way uh, because we actually in this space really want to see it all. But it's sometimes discouraging when things come in and you know people are trying to be overly salesy and you can't really see what's what and they're just trying to get on a call and you're like, friend, I do want to get on a call. Trust me, we do. But you know, can we be a little smarter about the business before we get on a call? It's just better for everybody. It's so busy. Let's be efficient. So yes, just get us, you know, <laughs> Break it down and, and, and take it's steps. So, it's it. so well said. And not to date myself, we tell our clients, it's like the old song by CNC Music Factory. Things that make you go, hmm. Your one-page teaser should say to someone like us, hmm, this looks interesting. Okay, I want to learn more. I want to know more. And I, I think you really hit the nail on the head. It. And Matt, we have two minutes left. So the floor is yours for the next two minutes. What would you like to... What message would you like to give the audience here today? Wow, that's a, um, a tough, I guess, strength in, in numbers, you know, uh, because we're heading into this inflection point where, um, you know, by midterms 2022, it, it ought to be very interesting, right? Because you need 60 votes in Senate right now. Um, you definitely want to have the uh, visibility to get something on Biden's desk you know, before um, going into the midterms, understanding, okay, you know, what states are important, by the way, because those state senators, depending on what they run on, uh, then if that state, uh, you know, is, is a positive state, whether Republican or Democrat, you, it comes with two votes, okay, in the Senate. So every state is equally important as the next because of those Senate votes. And, and we think there's a lot bigger issues Okay, that, that are going on over the next year and a half. And this is a bipartisan issue in comparison to others. And so I think you're going to see both sides come to some agreements going into midterms. It's a popular topic for, uh, you know, raising capital and, and, and getting votes in every state pretty much. And so you'll see more people run on that that didn't have to in the last election cycle. So we think after midterms, um, there's a really good chance that some that some big big things happen there. In advance of that, you know, banking will probably happen. Some other things, uh, inclu including quarterly earnings. And so I'll, I'll, I think the, the the reason I tell you that is because it's time for us to be thinking work together. Yep. You know, it's like if you watched uh, Game of Thrones or something. It's like the the Night Walkers are coming. Okay, it, <laughs> it's inevitable. And if you don't all come together as kingdoms, you, you know, you'll, you'll, you, it'll be much more difficult, but together it's a, it's a great victory. And, uh, and I hope that Arcadian can be a part of that. Visit our website. Hope you, hope you, we can talk to you soon, but um, God bless you. You know what, Matt, your timing was perfect. You ended right on time. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, if you have any other questions, please reach out to, to Matt uh, directly, to his, uh, he'll put his contact information uh, in there. Also to really pay attention to what he said. You know, you need to prepare ahead of time, okay? Work on that one page executive summary. Cause I'll tell you right now, if you have that one page executive summary, you're gonna open up a lot more doors than sending out your 30 or 40 page pitch deck because myself, I'm sure Matt and other uh, investors here and other from other funds will get sent all these decks and we're like it's 30 pages just give me the one page summary let's make this more simplistic so um so matt once again thank you so much also for all the panelists please make sure you look at the q a in case there's any questions for you um once again uh matt, matt norgan of arcadian capital and we are going to move on to our next uh our next panelist thanks again matt really do appreciate it so our next panel topic is what role does security compliance play in having Wall Street invest in cannabis? And I'm very proud to say that uh, my fr a friend of mine, John Nemanik, uh, who is a partner in Green Coast Capital, will actually be moderating this. And uh, before I, I do John's intro, John, hola, como esta? 
I believe. Muy bien, gracias a usted. <laughs> uh, bien, gracias, mi amigo, gracias. So, so John does a lot uh, of work down in South America, specifically Colombia. John's a partner in Green Coast Capital Investments. Green Coast is an international investor providing flexible and innovative financing to the small cap and micro cap marketplace in a, a variety of sectors. His team consists of experts in capital markets making quick decisions to provide growth capital to issuers. John is a serial entrepreneur and an investor. He was a co-founder, chairman, and CEO of three, I repeat, three very successful internet startups. The first one was in 2006. We raised over 29 million and then sold it to Deluxe Communications for over 124 million. He also had a couple other groups, uh, which uh, he sat here and was able to sit here and increase their market cap to over $600 million. And in 1999, uh, his internet direct company was merged with Look Communications for a deemed value of $560 million. So everyone paying attention, John's the real deal. He knows what he's doing. His current interests are medical cannabis, cultivation hemp, CBD startups with a focus, and I repeat, a focus in Colombia. He's married to uh, Dr. Sandra Carrillo, a leading expert in cannabis for clinical applications and was appointed the clinical professor in charge of the scientific program for cannabis research and education for the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Panama. John manages Panamanian and Colombian-based companies. He's a former member of EO Panama and has extensive contacts within Panama. He was also a former member of EO in Toronto and right now, he's really looking for high return opportunities to invest in and serve as a director for high quality campus related firms. Everyone, John is an entrepreneur, an investor, both domestically and internationally. And he understands the medical component to this side of the medicine as well, too. John, thank you for moderating today's panel. The rest of the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Dave, for a most wonderful introduction. I think I should leave now on this high note. I mean, <laughs> it's not going to get any better. <laughs> Anyways, I never cease to be impressed by the quality of the speakers. John Thompson, Matthew Norgren, thank you for your insights. It's extremely valuable. And Matt, in particular, your commentary reminds me of many years past when I worked as a manager at the Bank of Nova Scotia Mid-Market Accounts. When it came to granting loans, we had two questions. What do they want? And how can we say no? Needless to say, I got sick of being in banking after a couple of years, but it was a great experience. Anyways, I'd like to start by introducing Ted Bernhardt, Managing Director, Cultiva Law, and Kevin Albert, Independent Director, NorCal Cannabis Company. Ted, please give us a one to two minute introduction. Ted, take it away. Yep, uh, thanks for the intro. It's an honor to be on the panel here today. Um, I, my, my name is Ted Bernhardt. I'm the uh, managing partner for Cultiva Law. We are a cannabis dedicated business and finance law firm that is based on the entire West Coast of uh, the United States here. We have offices in Seattle, Portland, where I'm based, uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles and are gradually uh, expanding eastward. Um, and so our, our firm is focused on uh, helping entrepreneurs raise capital and uh, get into the industry and structure their transactions uh, uh, in a, a legally compliant manner. Uh, my background is uh, I've, I've been doing this since the mid to but since about 2015. Uh, before that, I was in the uh, I, the uh, technology spaces and energy spaces, and I actually acted as a, a, a general partner of, of four different venture capital funds before I started practicing law. So anyway, it's an honor to be here, and thanks for the introduction you know i was i googled your bio and you were portland's business journal 40 under 40 award given the most accomplished influential and uh civic minus uh, minded executives in portland just want to say good for you and you know what you have the type of bio we could spend 20 minutes just discussing your accomplishments that's really uh, nice of you to say yeah it's well, an honor it's just the truth so on to uh kevin albert kevin please give us a one to two minute introduction. Sure, thank you, John. And I've, I'd like to find out how you guys got those screensavers behind you. Uh, all I have is <laughs> a, a picture of people laying on a beach somewhere. 
Um, so my name is Kevin Albert, um, and I guess uh, I have a, a, a very institutional background, so it's probably quite appropriate for this panel. I spent uh, the first 24 years of my career uh, as a banker at Merrill Lynch, um, for, and for most of that time, I raised, I, I ran the private placement group, uh, which both raised funds for private equity firms, general purpose private equity firms, and it raised money for emerging growth companies like the companies in this industry, um, albeit bigger size deals than uh, many of the placements that get done in this industry. Um, I uh, then subsequently, after leaving Merrill Lynch, I worked for two private equity firms um, uh, and I retired in December 2019, just in time to be locked down and stuck at home uh, in the, uh, during COVID. I started investing in this industry in 2016 on a personal basis, both because of the dynamics of the industry um, and because, you know, I know my limitations and I'm not going to be ever going to be a successful venture investor in healthcare or AI or any of these highly technical things. But this is basically a consumer industry. I'm a consumer. I know what I like. I can make assessments as to what other people like. And, you know, it was sort of my view that uh, by investing in this industry, you knew the product worked, you knew people would buy it. And the only question was the management teams and their ability to execute. And I think that sort of enters into this topic because uh, it's, it's really all about the management teams, both in terms of execution on the business plan, but also in terms of setting up compliant companies that have good corporate governance. And as in any emerging industry, that typically isn't the case in the very beginning. In the very beginning of any industry, but particularly this one, which was federally illegal, um, you, you find that many of the companies were founded uh, in, the, in the early days by dreamers, by entrepreneurs, by people who had been black market cultivators or black market distributors. Um, and they are probably the best people to have spawned these industries, but they're probably not the best people uh, to get the attention of Wall Street, ultimately, um, and because they don't have the background. It's not that they're not smart and capable, they just don't have the background um, of having, you know, come up the ranks. So that's my background. I'm on the, I'm the board of three California companies currently, uh, one public one, Harborside, uh, and, two, and two private ones, Locana and, uh, and NorCal, and I'm on the advisory board of, of one of the industry funds. You know, again, I, I also Googled your background, Kevin, and I noticed, for example, that you're associated with Harbor, uh, Harborside. I actually participated in the most recent private placement with Harborside. Well done, good work, you know? So just, I just wanted to declare that if anybody sees that as a possible conflict of interest. <laughs> <laughs> no, Anyways, no, no, we're, all, we're, we're aligned, we're aligned. Well, of course, of course. <laughs> you know, I, I, I mean, to be frank for open disclosure, I'm probably, in, I haven't counted late recently, but probably at eight different private placements just in my own personal accounts, plus what I'm doing also with Green Coast as well. So anyways, gentlemen, uh, I'd like to open up with the following questions and we'll ask both of you. So I'm gonna ask the question and both of you, I'd like you to provide your perspective on this. And, uh, you know, Kevin, you've already alluded, you've already sort of um, segued nicely into, um, uh, into investing into the risks. And what I'd like to do is open by this with the following. So during my um, early four days, forays into cannabis investing, I thought, <laughs> I understood regulatory risk and I was wrong. I underestimated, for example, just how challenging it can be to stay on side. How do you manage regulatory risks as a director with the companies you're associated with? And tell us why it is so important because I, don't, because I believe there are some people who are not familiar with what the challenges of regulatory risk are and how that can really, really put holes into their aspirations. Which one? I don't okay, want to let, let, let me rephrase. What do you, what, what do you see as the, uh, how do you manage regulatory risk? What do you do with your entities? Like you're saying on the board of Harborside. Yeah, so, okay, yeah. so in, in my opinion, well, first of all, as a director, you can't actually make it happen in the, mm -hmm. in the company because right. you're a director, you're not 
you're actually supposed to be supervising management as opposed to doing things yourself, because if you do them yourself, there's nobody overseeing you. Um, and that's one principle of, of good corporate governance. Um, so what, what is important for the directors to know is it's important for them to know the regulatory regime, what the key rules are, what the regulators are focused on, um, and then to employ good compliance people or a person, depending on the size of the company, and to ensure that that person, you know, has a game plan uh, for addressing those issues and, and does it. And to evaluate that on a, you know, a semi-annual, a quarterly basis sort of depends again on the size of the company. The best example of the downside of not doing that is a company called Lowell in California, which is a, a branded uh, a flower pre-roll company, uh, which uh, got caught, I think, about 18 months ago, uh, operating out of an unlicensed facility. They were licensed. They had all the you know license they needed to do to, to prosecute their business, um, you know, in general. But for some reason or other, they decided to cut a corner and, and, and operate out of an unlicensed facility for a period of time. Um, and then it went from being probably the hottest brand at that particular point in time uh, to a company that became quickly distressed um, and, and just recently had to sell itself uh, at a fraction of what its value was uh, back at that particular period of time. Because who, who's going to invest? You know, all of these companies need a continuing flow of, of capital to come in to grow. And who's going to put money into a company that has a breach like that mm -hmm. when really most of the other companies don't? Most of the other companies are compliant. I mean, the regulatory aspects of this industry are, are very significant and, and the regulators are very serious about it because if the states don't do a good job, then the feds may come in. Uh, that basically the whole, I forget what it, the letter is called, but the letter that Obama had issued, which, which said, uh, hands off the states, it said hands off the states if they are doing a good job in, in, in terms of, of, of managing this industry. Well said. And for all you uh, would-be entrepreneurs out there who are serious about going in this sector, remember what he just said. Lowell's was extremely successful and um, they literally watched their dreams of your pardon the pun go up in smoke. So um, now I'm gonna go on to Ted Bernhardt, who is a securities attorney. And Ted, I'd like to ask you a similar question. Um, what advice do you give your clients on how to manage the regulatory risk? That's a great question. And, and um, I, I appreciate both of your insights on that. Uh, first of all, I think you're referring to the Cole memo. Um, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. the um uh it's interesting because um my law practice and our firm we we work with people uh across the entire spectrum from the very earliest stage to you know IPO and the and the latest stage. Um but I would say most of the um people that uh first come to us are are coming to us in the very early stages and a lot of them are, are coming from um the basically the pre-legalization era, the medical industry, the, you know, I'm not going to say the black or the gray market or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that I raise with people is before I even get into the details of how regulated this is, what the specific regulations are that they have to comply with, I, I want them to understand that uh, they need to commit to being regulatorily compliant, that this industry uh, has sort of a wild west cowboy, you know, uh, 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 a reputation history or whatever uh that's changing and um you have to change your business models and your compliance mentality in order to do that so it, you know the first thing i try and convince people of is that uh the uh, you know if you want to achieve the path to liquidity and the legitimacy of this market you have to be aware that it's highly regulated and that you have to be committed to uh complying with those sorts of regulations. Then I sort of turn to you, uh, talking to them about what the, the, the types of regulations are that they have to deal with. And, you know, it's, you've got federal and, and state regulations, you've got, you know, uh, uh, people a lot of times don't realize that uh, 
uh, like things like securities laws uh, apply to them here, and if you're raising money <laughs> yeah. at the startup <laughs> stage, uh, you know, just because it's from friends and family, you still have to be worried about all that sort of thing. So I kind of try and you know, in the introductory sessions, I kind of try and flag issues and areas of compliance for them based on my experience uh, with things that trip people up and uh, get them started to think about it. And then, you know, you know, obviously I encourage them to keep a good dialogue going with me and their other professional service providers and to recruit people who are familiar with uh, these sorts of uh, compliance risks and really build out their team to come up with a, 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 a regulatory compliance <laughs> infrastructure that, that, that will help them. And then, you know, then, th then we sort of dive into the specific details. And the last thing I will say is that I, I also very much try to give them a reality check that there are, there are actual economic consequences to these regulations. It's not just about whether you go to jail or not. There's hmm. a lot of time and energy that you have to spend in complying with these various regulations that, and, and to just be ready for that and build those into your financial models and your projections and your operating plans and, and all that sort of stuff. So um, it, it goes back to what you both were saying, sort of educating people about these risks as early on before it becomes a problem so that you're not trying to fix it in the future, but you're making them aware so that proactively they can um, deal with them. So that, that's kind of the approach I take generally. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. You just shared some extremely valuable information for those who are paying attention. So that's mm -hmm. great. So I'm gonna bounce back to Kevin Albert. And Kevin, I'd like to ask what in your view are the greatest opportunities in the cannabis space and what do you see as the greatest challenges? So I, I think we're, we've largely moved uh, uh, through this sort of early entrepreneurial start a new company from scratch, at least in the vanilla categories of like uh, cultivation and manufacturing and, dis and, and, uh, and, and retail, if you will, dispensaries. Um, there's always going to be more opportunities and certainly there are going to be new entrepreneurial opportunities and new states that are opening up. But in states like California um, or, or Washington or, Co or Colorado, I, I think there are probably enough platforms in that area. And so I think the, uh, there are two kinds of opportunities. One are the more scientific opportunities, you know, tissue culture, biotechnology, medicine. Um, all of which start to exceed, I know I'm not going to be good at, so that kind of, that's the kind of exposure I look to get in a fund. I can mm -hmm. figure out if I, if a dispensary platform is a good one or a, a cultivation platform is a good one. I'm out in California right now. I visited 10 dispensaries and about six farms in the last two days. Um, and, uh, but I think the big general opportunity right now is to help rationalize and consolidate the industry. One of the unique parts of this industry, yeah. one of the reasons I got into it, is it is funded by individuals and family offices. And even the funds that exist, the 10 to 15 funds, are funded by individuals and family offices. So there's no institutional money uh, and there's no private equity. Typically, private equity firms, and there are hundreds of them, as you know, they are the people who come in and rationalize an industry. They take the inefficient companies and bolt them on to the efficient companies and make them bigger, you know, train them how to become public companies. Um, and, you know, not RTO, tiny micro cap public companies, but real mm -hmm. public companies. And <laughs> that opportunity now exists for us. And one of the things I'm out here doing in California on, on, on behalf of one of the companies I'm involved in is helping to, tr is, is trying to do that. Uh, with them, trying to make them bigger by finding, um, uh, oppor you know, merger opportunities, basically, uh, because that's now what happen has to happen in this industry. We don't need, we don't need hundreds of small companies. We need, um, you know, handfuls of big, dynamic, vertically integrated companies, at least in states where vertical inter integration um, is allowed. So I'd, I'd encourage people to look for opportunities to invest with very capable management teams who have their own house in order, who are ready to help start clean up this industry. Excellent. You know, I don't think a lot of entrepreneurs appreciate just how important what you, what you just said about the roll-ups and the M&As. Let's say, for example, a company like Atria, MO, 
they're not going to waste their time buying anything that's under a billion dollars because it's just not going to move the needle for them. So if you could do a roll up and consolidation, then you actually have real exit strategies. And yes, being a Canadian and knowing a little bit about RTOs, (laughs) I get where you're coming from. So anyways, I'm going to bounce now to Ted. And Ted, being a securities lawyer, being a lawyer, I think uh, an attorney, you can appreciate this. Uh, I'm sure you'll be able to help us answer this question. I'd like to know, how do you protect IP in a federally illegal industry? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. And um, IP is, is certainly a, a huge portion and probably an increasing portion of the uh, valuable assets of the companies in this industry. Um, uh, there, there are a lot of ways to protect IP. And, uh, you know, I could spend an entire day talking mm-hmm. about that, but I will give you sort of the thumbnail sketch that maybe has some some tips that, that could help. Um, so all IP is people, when people say IP initially, they think of usually like patents, filed with the federal government or trademarks filed with the federal government. Uh, There is an entire world of intellectual property that transcends that and does not necessarily require the federal government's uh, approval. Uh, On the the hemp side of things, you're getting some more latitude at at federal, you know, trademark registrations and things like that. But um, what I would encourage people to do is one for their for their trademarks, uh, protecting their logos and their brand names and things like that. Look to the state. uh, protection because I know at least on the West Coast, up and down the West Coast, there's um, plenty of ways you can you can file for protection in California or or, or wherever uh, related to 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 that, and it, it doesn't necessarily have the national scope uh, that you would with federally, but it's better than being completely un, unprotected. The other thing that I would encourage people to think about is um, that there's this concept called trade secrets, which um, does not require filing with the federal government to protect. Instead, it's the opposite of that. It's not about public disclosure and then protection by the government. It's about how well you keep your secrets to yourself and what sort of procedures you've put in place to protect them. You know, the classic example of that is sort of Coke's recipe for Coca-Cola or, you know, things like that. Uh, a lot of people are developing recipes for making products out of cannabis and, and things like that, but it, it can even be broader than that. It can include operating procedures and you know, manufacturing procedures and things like that. So most of my clients, I really encourage them to focus on the trade secrets and putting into place the, um, the compliance mechanisms to make sure that your trade secrets are, are protected uh, and, and defensible if they, if they ever get challenged. So th- that would be my recommendation is sort of the, the state approach for, uh, for trademark protection and, uh, and then focus really heavily on, on confidentiality and, and trade secrets and, and, and things like that. That's great. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, we're coming towards the end. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. So I'm going to give, starting with Kevin, I'm going to give you an opportunity in a minute or so just to summarize or to just to say anything you would like to uh, say or anything you'd like to add to the conversation. Yeah. So in addition to sort of regulatory compliance, one of the things that I was surprised at when I got into this industry um, and I'm on a number of boards, so you won't be able to tell which one I'm talking about. Um, it's certainly not talking about the public company uh, mm-hmm. because they're they're pretty organized in the corporate governance front. But there's this thing called corporate governance and, okay. and sort of having policies and procedures in the company. And I've been on a, the board of a public company before. I've been in a large Wall Street investment bank where they are, you know, have pretty good corporate governance. And one of the things that struck me as being odd and need, needing a lot of improvement is a lot of internal processes like making big investments, making big commitments are, are still done by the seat of people's pants uh, without uh, writing up, you know, if you want to go buy something and it's, you know, $20 million, you know, people just kind of have a dinner and talk about it and they go buy the money, they go buy it. They don't necessarily have the money. They might have to go raise the money. Um, And what I'd like to see and what I'm encouraging and the companies I'm involved in is have an actual process where you write an investment up in an investment committee memo and you circulate that, you know, to senior management and to the board um, and you get uh, all the brains looking at it and you get a formal approval. Uh, to spend anything over, you know, I don't know, a million dollars, 500,000, you know, the number can vary uh, depending on the circumstance of that company. 
Um, and they would also look at things like, you know, do we have this money in the bank or do we have to raise the money to actually fund that investment? Because you look back <laughs> at uh, 2019, most companies got themselves into a jam by, you know, there was this thing called the green rush. People went out and they were buying dispensaries with big notes that came due in a year or two. Uh, because they didn't have the money uh, or they were buying manufacturing facilities. I mean, you name it, very large numbers. And then when the capital market shut down and they shut down very quickly and very firmly, they were unable and basically uh, had big liquidity problems. Now, most companies worked their way out of that, but it was a very costly because typically you had to go to the party and negotiate with them and issue stock and cash, you know, to settle the obligation. So I'd like to see a lot more, a lot better corporate governance. And frankly, you can't go public until you get your house in order with respect to both regulatory and corporate governance, in my opinion. Agreed. Uh, we've seen already a few uh, disasters in the public sector. I won't name any companies that didn't get that part right. And uh, Ted, sorry to rush you a minute or so. If yep. you have anything you would like to add, I'll make it really quick. Uh, so first of all, that I got to say, the number of times people come to me with handshake deals for million dollar, two million, ten million dollar <laughs> investments is is crazy. So like, please don't do that. You'll end up in our litigation department really fast if you do that. Um, but the second thing I wanted to say is I actually kind of want to answer the question that you asked Kevin before. And so now I'll, I'll just do that real fast. What what are the trends and what's what, what am I seeing in the industry? Usually when mm -hmm. people ask me that. They, they're, they're expecting me to say like, oh, is processing or cultivation or, you know, uh, uh, retail or is, is that where it's headed? Where, where's the big, you know what I think? I, I think the things that both of you mentioned are really where the growth opportunities are. One, bringing professional man management to these industries of people who have experience in other industries who can bring that expertise here, who also understand and sort of get the social content and the benefits to the community of this. And so recruiting that sort of professional level expertise, uh, I think is, 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 is probably the biggest thing that, uh, that you can do. And then the second is, uh, uh, I, I do totally agree with sort of the corporate governance and, and, uh, you know, building the best board that you can a, around these companies as well, because, uh, the, 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 in order to grow and, and, and thrive, I think you need to, do that and i am also i just want to echo one other point i i am actually seeing a huge trend towards consolidation in the industry and i think that's kind of the next big play is a bunch of these fragmented uh smaller businesses that have built built a good reputation within the states that they're in because of the regulatory environments are going to start rolling into larger uh umbrella companies and and seeking liquidity on the capital market that way so anyway that's the real fast version but thank you for the opportunity <laughs> oh no that was excellent and i'm going to very strongly suggest to brad that you guys both be invited back and i would love to do an extended panel if you so if you guys both feel so inclined because to me, this is among the most 20 minutes, very extremely valuable 20 minutes just spending listening to you gentlemen. And, and I hope the audience appreciates the pearls of wisdom that you've cast to them. So anyways, time for me to move on. Back to the Dr. Dr. Dave, uh, <laughs> double PhD. And if you guys ever want some, uh, you in the audience, if you ever want to find out an interesting backstory, you should check out his bio. I mean, it's actually incredible. You know, Dave, Dr. Dave, you should really write a book about that someday. Anyways, over to you, Dave. Uh, I thank you so much, Sean. I really do appreciate the nice words. And uh, that is the goal one day in a couple more years. Um, also, John, I just wanna say, you did a great job monitoring that panel. And to the last two speakers, Ted and Kevin, thank you so much. Um, I also learned a lot as well too. And I really think John hit the nail on the head. 20 minutes is just not enough time. and the information you gave was so insightful to so many people. And I really hope that people took down the notes. Uh, Kevin and Ted, just please make sure you check the que question and answer part on the, on the bottom of your screen to make sure uh, if you have any case you have any questions. If you want to put any of your key uh, LinkedIn information or any other key contact information, please feel free to include it in the chat room. Uh, with that being said, we're going to move on to our next panel. And our next panel, is, the topic is getting out of the weeds. Leveraging Star Power, Media Assets, and Strategic Partnerships in Cannabis. This is a very hot topic because it's not as simple as people think 
uh, it is to get a celebrity to sit here and to endorse you or to be an influencer for you. There's really more to it. Um, and we have Dara Payne here of Cannabis Venture Partners, who is actually going to do his own intro. And Darren, I'll let you introduce uh, the, your panelists because you are the moderator. And we all look forward for you, uh, for all of us to learn a little bit more about what it takes to actually uh, leverage star power. Um, so the floor is yours, Darren. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the intro, David. Uh, once again, my name is Darian Payne. I am the COO or Chief Operating Officer here at CVP. That's Cannabis Venture Partners. Um, just a quick high level about CVP. What we are is, uh, what our mission is, is to help our clients win big in the cannabis industry. We help them by navigating uh, their, their potential pitfalls and also as well as ob observing their strengths and uh, capitalizing off of those sorts of things. Um, as vague as that sounds, it's only because we have a expert in almost every realm of cannabis working um, as a departmental head to help us to uh, navigate these kind of treacherous waters. Um, we, give me just a moment. We work with executive leadership, corporate structuring, business development, leveraging technology, which happens to be my personal favorite, accounting and finance, government consulting and community advocacy, another very strong point for us, strategic partnership development, what we're talking about today, marketing and branding, also something we're gonna speak on today, operations and licensing. These are just some of the offerings that CVP has out there. Um, now today, what we're speaking on most specifically is uh, leveraging star power, media assets and strategic partnerships in cannabis. And I wanted to uh, say, uh, give a little bit of applause to David for mentioning that it's not as simple as throwing out the person that's on a Wheaties box and expecting them to be able to sell a product. Um, the marketing landscape has changed in general across the board and that way of advertising and selling products is gone. Um, and it's gone even further away uh, from cannabis. You can't take a Wheaties approach. Um, you need to have these actual connections, strong relationships, and an understanding of these niche core groups that you're looking to sell to. Um, I come from a film background, and we always say niches get riches. So the ability to observe these things and to capitalize on data, marketing data, uh, purchasing, any sort of specific data that we can isolate and, and extract information from um, is, is perfect for what we do and it allows us to help our clients so much better. So without any more uh, ado, I'm going to kick it over to Cletus Mack, who is our CEO, but more than that, he is a friend and mentor, but he's also a Grammy nominated legendary rapper. He's, uh, he's multi-platinum selling uh, a rapper as well. And he helps us uh, to communicate and to work on our strategic partnerships with a multitude of different clients in both the entertainment world and athletics, as well as politics and policy. So without any further ado, I'm gonna kick it over to Cletus Mack, who is sitting near me. Hello, everyone. How y'all doing today? Pleasure to be here. Just wanted to talk to y'all about the difference of having a celebrity ambassador and an influencer. Now, what we do with CVP we don't just have an ambassador. Ambassador is somebody you bring in and say, hey, you put their name up. Hey, we have Snoop Dogg and he's a part of this and that and this and that. But you just see that picture, that one time picture and you see the stamp on the brand. And yeah, you, it works to a certain degree. But what we do is we bring in the celebrities. Like for me, myself, I go, I go as far as to be the CEO of a company and also bring the other celebrities along with me. And I make sure that they follow through all the way. So you might have a celebrity who is the name of something, but they're not posting it. They're not putting it on their IG. They're not hashtagging anything. And what we do with CVP is we make sure that they follow through the whole process. And we make sure that everybody is totally invested in the whole process to make sure that the business side works. And it's not just a quick green and go. Like the, the cannabis business doesn't work that way. It's not something that you can just jump into and win. You have to really know this business. And what we did with this company in particular, we put together, strategically put together all of the places, like far as 
uh, real estate, far as licensing, far as celebrity, every single thing that we need to do, we put it all together to make sure that we are the go-to people and we have everything on board with us. So we're basically like the standard, like, and we're working with the biggest companies in the business right now, the biggest brands, and they are very comfortable with working with us because we're very consistent on what we do when we make sure that we are consistently making sure that we work all the way through every single platform that it takes for this for this game and a lot of times what we have the problem is people end up being green on the green and when you're green on the green you don't really have the knowledge and the know-how to, to execute your next step you could put a whole lot of money in this business and end up stuck and that's what a lot of people end up face facing and what we do is we make sure that you never come in contact with that we make sure that you feel educated all the way throughout the whole process and also with the celebrities that we attach to you we make sure that they are acting and not just a face they are really working the product they are really moving and treating it like their business because we make sure that they are a part of the business and that's what strategically that's what we do to make sure that we can make sure it separates us from everyone else pretty much and with no further ado money b are you involved are you here like the money here, i'm here hey you guys hear me yes absolutely sir. everybody we got money b coming in right now um he is one of our management managers and consultants at cvp he is also a multi-platinum selling artist, if you can't tell by that mean looking plaque section in the back of his room there. <laughs> uh, he's also from the legendary rap group, Digital Underground, uh, with the, which is great lineage, but more than that, I think Money B has certain level of expertise when, when it comes to speaking to both realms. Um, so without any more, I'd leave it to you, Money B, please. Thank you, thank you, Darian. Hello, everyone. So, you know, like Darian said, you know, accolades you know grammy nominated we've sold tens of millions of of albums worldwide and you know i've been in the industry for 32 years but if you look around today uh digital underground is still relevant and you can see it in our you know placement in the new coming to america movie um men being mentioned in the television series blackish and it's not by accident, it's it's because, you know, we've, or I would say myself personally, you know, through all aspects of our career, I've kind of been hands on, you know, and cultivated the relationships. So, you know, with um, CVP, I'm not just an ambassador or a face of the of the company. You know, I'm actually, you know a part of the company. So, you know, I'm not just gonna be the guy that's, like you said, I'm not the guy in the Wheaties box. I'm actually doing the work. And there's nothing like uh, taking a business call about Digital Underground with Digital Underground. And that's that's what I do. You know, I, I'm in the trenches. I'm gonna do everything that it takes to, to, to close it and, and get it done. Um, you know, I've managed the Digital Underground brand for several years, uh, had been a part of and, and, and have managed, you know, video production companies and been involved in film, marketing, commercial, stage, everything like that. So I feel like, you know, I'm perfect to help um, facilitate and fulfill your needs when it comes to, to new media. You know, I actually sit on the board for a streaming company called Buyer Streaming Network. Um, it's fairly new, but it's in 116 countries and we have 13 niche channels. We're also launching a um, channel and platform specifically catering towards cannabis and hemp products called Cannavid TV. Um, and it's so Mark, is it fair to say that you understand quite well how to create your own opportunities as well as leverage what already exists in the market of the, the traditional ways of marketing these products? 
Yeah, because, you know, I, I, paying attention, like, you know, sometimes you can just, like you said, if I was only willing to lend my name and just say, hey, go ahead and paste my picture there. Anything that I get involved with, I research and I find out exactly how that company or how that process works. So, you know, if, if I go in the room and you start asking me questions, I know about the business that I'm promoting. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm fully uh, abreast of the operation and not just the uh, cosmetics of anything that I do. So, you know, like I said, with, uh, with um, Vire and Cannabit, you know, we, we welcome, you know, the cannabis community. Obviously, Cannabit TV is, is specifically for, but even at Vire, you know, the, the um, product placement and the ad and marketing opportunities are endless. Um, and I know, uh, I'm not sure how much time I have left, but I'm not sure if David Hill, who's actually the co-owner of uh, Vire and Cannabit, if he's, if he's on. David, are you there? Yes, I am. How, how, how's everybody doing? Can you hear me? Yes. We're in great. Welcome, Dave. We can Thank hear you. you. So I, I kind of wanted Dave to really quick talk about uh, another aspect of what we do, which is cash crop today. Dave, you want to jump in on that? Yeah. So around three years ago, we created a, a media platform called Cash Crop Today Media. Um, also, I'm working closely with uh, Darren, Cletus, and uh, Money B uh, within regard to this. Um, we created the business side of what cannabis and hemp is, growing um, stocks, uh, raising funds, um, basically like a whole, whole resource. Uh, currently right now, cashcroptoday.com, everybody can go download it or log on to it. Um, we have around 600,000 people that read that website a month. Um, it talks about all the publicly traded companies uh, that are in cannabis, who's high, who's low. Uh, we have a bunch of society, different levels of societies that, uh, and communities that, you know, we have some services that go along with what Cletus, Darren, and uh, Buddy B is saying. And also we have new shows that we're building out for Cannabis TV. Uh, the website is cashcroptoday.com. Uh, for the person that was just in the chat that said, uh, what's the website again? Um, yeah, so realistically, you know, marketing cannabis brands, it's a it's a tough thing to do nowadays, especially with all the rules. Um, you know, you can't do regular Facebook uh, target marketing, Instagram target marketing. You have to be real careful, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to be more creative, uh, partnering with uh, talent, influencers uh, that actually control those Instagram posts, et cetera, et cetera more so is so important, as well as if you are a company that is public on the OTC markets, or OTB markets, um, doing curated content, um, curated articles, uh, being on multiple different platforms, or just building up that community. Um, currently, we've built a community of uh, 72,000 uh, emails and people that's actually engaging with Cash Crop today. Uh, not to mention the 600,000 people that uh, read it per month. And we're growing out. We have uh, one coming up in April um, called Foodie Dispensary. Foodie Dispensary is all foods, meaning we already have over 300 uh, different recipes on how to cook, um, how to cook with cannabis, all the way from gourmet meals to snacks for events and parties. And we have another platform that we're cultivating right now, curating. Uh, right now is about growth and it goes from the agriculture to the farming to all of that type of stuff like that. So definitely we have various different places that we can plug into any companies and everything. And we have a history of doing it for 22 years. Not to cut you off. Um, that's great information. We've got Dave's uh, website and info pinged in there and you could also get in contact with anybody from CBP to further this discussion. But we are coming close on time and we've got one last, well, two, two last guests, but one special, very, very special guest to, to have speak here. He's the co-founder and owner of Leaves of Legends, a cannabis brand and a two-time Grammy winning artist and multi-platinum selling artist from the, from the group Bone Thugs and Harmony. 
as a Cleveland native, I consider him one of the greats and uh, I'm quite a fan and he's a great mentor as well as co-founder. Give it up everybody for Crazy Bone, welcome him. And I'm gonna leave the floor to him. Uh, Craig, please take it. Yeah, man, I'm gonna be real quick. You know what I'm saying? First of all, thanks for bringing me back to this forum. You know what I'm saying? I had a good time last time and uh, it's good to be back in behalf of League of Legends. Shout out to everybody over here that I, you know what I'm saying, that I'm used to seeing on a daily basis. Money B, Cletus Mack, Darian, Liz, you know what I'm saying, the whole team, the whole squad, Joseph, what's happening? Um, just want to let everybody know, you know, that Leaves of Legend is a, is a, is a premium cannabis brand. And our main focus is, you know, on the culture and the community. Just to be real short, uh, when I say that, I have a, I have a partnership with the Cleveland School of Cannabis. And um, we have a scholarship program to where we help to, uh, we, we, we choose minorities or people from the community, where I'm from back in Cleveland. And, uh, you know, we, we, we give them a free scholarship and put them through this program to give them knowledge of the whole cannabis industry and have them learn, you know, like the different techniques or whatever it is, you know, grower or owner dispensaries. They, they get all this knowledge, you know, so they'll be able to go out and work in the work in this field. This uh, very, very rising very rapidly, you know what I'm saying? So um, also um, I'm excited to announce that, uh, you know, in in anticipation for 420, we are launching our cannabis brand in other states, and we're like growing very rapidly right now in collaborations with Cookies as well. You know, staying moving into different areas with, with like Oklahoma and Washington and Colorado. Um, also, I have an album coming out entitled Leaves of Legend. You know, it's kind of like the soundtrack for the cannabis, you know what I'm saying? So while you Indulge it in the cannabis, you got a soundtrack to play along with it. You know what I'm saying? I'm giving you everything you need for that. You know what I'm saying? And um, you know, the whole album is dedicated, it's, it's, it's 12 songs on the album, basically signature cannabis songs. If you're a Bone Thugs and Harmony fan, then you know how much we have been advocates of uh cannabis throughout our career. We always dedicated songs or two or three to cannabis on each project. Um and so the uh, the album is dedicated to the cannabis culture, man, and got a lot of classic songs on there. So before I get up out of here, just want everybody to let y'all know we are looking to raise capital for capital for what we're doing. You know, we're looking for strategic get, um, investors and partners. Uh, this is a great opportunity to come and, you know, like be a part of what we're doing. Because like I said, we're reaching back into the community. We're, we're doing charitable events and everything like basically giving back that's something i really never seen any cannabis brands do but like giving back to the community and for the people that really risk their lives and you know like put in work to like bring this to the mainstream i feel like a lot of this money should be going back to the people that were penalized for using this for so many years you know and, and of course we help bring this to the mainstream so it's only right so that's all i wanted to say like i said thank you all for having me and uh yeah if y'all interested in a, you know what i'm saying talking to us about the brand, get at me or get at like any one of these people you see on here, Money B, Darian, Cletus, anybody you see on here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate you, you, you mentioned coming on as well too. Um, we, got, we got about 30 seconds left. So, so Darian, let me ask you this. In the last 30 so seconds, what do you want to tell the audience here today? Yeah. What, what I'd like to say is that the marketing in cannabis can be tricky. It can be treacher treacherous, conventional. Sorry, 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 Darian. I, I do. Let, let's have Liz close us out. Sorry about that. We, we have Liz and our, our esteemed attorney partner, who's also a civil rights activist. You know, there's uh, she's on the front lines of social equity and doing all kinds of amazing things. Liz, why don't you close us out? Please. All right. Thank you for that. And I'm sorry, Darian. Um, I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. I already I just wanted to say social equity is so important. It's a huge piece in cannabis investing. And if morals is not uh, the only thing that drives you, uh, there's just two reasons why you should care about social equity before we close out this group today. And it's that the strategic partnerships and social equity will ro make your business robust. Um, there is no business that won't benefit from making sure that you form those strategic partnerships throughout the communities that are underserved uh, by the criminalization of cannabis. Um, and the fact that you promoting the legalization, and we have a lot of work to do to continue uh, legalizing this business, 
uh, is only going to increase the eligibility for business partners and the market. Um, and secondly, and I know uh, Mr. Ted Bernhard uh, spoke to this already, but the compliance will make or break your business or at least uh, cause you to miss opportunities. So if nothing else, the compliance aspect of making sure that um, your business is compliant with all licensing requirements um, is the second benef uh, benefit to making sure that you are caring about social equity. So I don't wanna take up too much of more of your time, but thank you for the opportunity to be here and uh, for listening to our panel. And Liz, thank you so much for bringing that up as well too, because social equity is, is very important. Um, everyone, uh, all our panels, please make sure you look at the, the question and answer part. I know, uh, we just had uh, someone give a question for John Nemanic from, from the previous panel. Uh, Darian, Joseph, uh, Liz, I see y'all already put your information in the chat room. Feel free to do it again. And honestly, it's all about helping each other on this community and, and really thinking about the bigger picture overall. Uh, very powerful stuff. Thank you so much for being on. And we're gonna move on to our, our last panel discussion before we go on to the investor pitch deck competition. So the last panel topic is how is a government grant funded project assisting minority businesses? And I myself actually, uh, Dr. David will be the moderator for this. Um, very quick background about myself. If you're just joining us, doctor of physical therapy, doctor of healthcare management, been in Canvas since 2009, seven different Canvas companies in five different states. Um, so that's really important today is that uh, the people to our, our speakers that we have today are actually part of NABEDSI, which is funded by the United States Department of Congress. Um, <clears throat> the Bureau of Minority Business, uh, which is, I'm sorry, funded by the United States Department of Commerce, Bureau of Minority Business Development Agency. And their goal is to provide no cost business development services to American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians located in Arizona, Utah, Nevada, and the Navajo Nation. Uh, their direct services include resources for starting and or growing your business, assessing capital, and locating and bidding on opportunities, market resources, export assistance, manufacturing resources, and other services as well too. Um, with that being said, we have several people here today who are panelists. So I would, uh, we have Eugene Robinson, Jabari Starks, Carolyn Graves, and Peter Swartz. Uh, because of our time limit, what I'd like to do is, I'd like to start with Eugene Robinson, and if you all could just give a 45 second introduction about yourself and your background. So we'll start with Eugene first, and then we'll go uh, proceed with Giovanni next. Hey, how you doing? Can you Great, hear me? Eugene. You got, you got 45 seconds to do an intro, introduction on, uh, on yourself and on your background for the audience, please. Sure, absolutely. So I'm Eugene Robinson. I am the co-founder and COO of Midwest Buds, uh, located in uh, Arizona. Um, a little bit about my background. Um, I have over 20 years of experience in supply chain, uh, financial services, um, and uh, working with, I, I was uh, working with Intel um, running their global supply chain uh, for a couple of years and um, also worked on in the commercial space doing small businesses for uh, companies like uh, Bank of America and Chase. Um, so that's a little bit about me and uh, we'll tell you a little bit more as we go along in the uh, process here. Oh, can you not see me? He's muted. I, I, I can't hear you, you're muted. Sorry about that. Thank you. I would say, is, uh, is Giovanni with us today? As yeah, well? Giovanni's here as well. Giovanni, uh, I will say both you guys are completely blacked out with the way you got the sun behind you, but we can see you fine. Just so you know. Okay. So, so, no, it's all good. So, uh, so Giovanni, uh, in 45 seconds, let's talk about uh, your background, please. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Giovanni Starks. I am the CEO of Midwest Buds. I have over 15 years of sales experience, management, and coaching. Uh, I used to be a supervisor for McKesson Specialty Health. Uh, also, I am an up-and-coming music artist in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, and that's pretty much my background. I graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater. 
uh, with a degree in physical education, pre-law and coaching. Uh, and that's pretty much it. That's, that's the nail. That's the nail in the coffin for me. <laughs> you know, perfect. You did that in 39 seconds, my friend. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to ask Karen Lynn Graves, who's a project director of NABC, to give a 45 second background uh, on yourself first, please. Thank you. You're, you're muted, Karen. I'm not now. Yep. Karen Lynn Graves. I'm the project director for Nabedsi. So um, in my role, just overseeing activities, grant funded activities, and I'm joined here by my colleague, Peter Schwartz. And Peter, why don't you go next and end and, 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 and up with us. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my, my background has uh, been in government uh, my whole life. Um, I've been working in Indian country for about 25 years with economic development, job creation, um, and helping them assist to uh, get into the cannabis and hemp industry. Um, and so, and Midwest Buzz is one of our clients and, and we're here to support them. Great. And, and I appreciate you both being here. And I think this is great for everyone that is listening and attending from all around the world that Midwest Buzz is, is a client uh, of Nabedsi. So I know this is a very loaded topic. And I know we only have about 15 minutes or so. So I, I like to ask this first question to Karen and to Peter directly. And this first question is this, could you list an example uh, of a funded project by, uh, by the government that's assisting minority businesses? And can you tell us um, how the project came about pretty much um, and what your role was in that? And if we could answer it within about four minutes so we can ask a couple more questions, that'd be great. Sure. So let me start with how Nabedsi got started. That'd be um, awesome. Okay. So about four or five years ago, the U.S. Department of Commerce Bureau of Minority Business Development started hearing a lot of talks in the background from different communities about not getting the services that they were looking for. So more specifically, our American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians. So the MBDA did what's referred to as a tribal consultation and started getting feedback to find out what could we do a little bit different. So what, we, what came as a result of that was we need to have more presence. So there was a, an, a grant opportunity that went out and our office, and we, we are operated or overseen by the um, Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. We went after this grant and we were able to receive it. So essentially what we do under our grant, we call it Nabedsi, but we provide business development services. So that's everything from helping to find money, different types of loan, investment opportunities, to just um, business education from startup and beyond. So more specifically with ours, we ended up serving um, veterans, our youth, women, um, immigrants, uh, uh, disabled individuals, a whole gamut of, of different services that we're providing to all. So essentially, again, it all stems under MBDA for Minority Business Development Agency. Great, and then so, for, and you said that uh, Eugene and uh, Giovanni, they're clients of yours, correct? They are clients of ours. And so could you do this really quick um, for the audience? Um, did you find them or did they find you? And like how that interaction go, like tell, tell our audience, like how do they find out about, uh, about Nabedsi and how that whole interaction went through? That'd be great. So, so they are clients, uh, direct clients of Peter's, and I'm going to go ahead and let Peter explain how how we found each other. So, so Midwest Buzz, they reached out to us and, and, and explained what they were trying to get into the hemp industry with the legalization that was coming up of it, uh, and they were already into the cannabis industry, uh, and just asked for our help and advice on, on how to do things. So, um, obviously, with the government, you know, that's each state is different what they have. Um, and so we're trying to help them uh, get into the underprivileged areas, the uh, opportunity zones, these type of things to uh, conduct their business to help in the rural areas. And then we're here, of course, here to support them and, and with yep. trying to find investors and these type of things. If, if so if, if I may, I'm sorry, let me add one more piece to this because we got to, I want to make sure we're, we're, we're connecting the dots. Another thing that we're assisting them with is relationships with different tribes. We know that we need to have economic development, you know, activities within our different tribal communities and what better way than having their product. 
So it's not a secret that, you know, you may have hemp, you may have cannabis, but you also have the wraparound services. We have agriculture companies who provide, you know, um, you know, different fertilizers. I mean, you have packaging. It's a whole lot of different services that are provided. So, but we're honored, like I shared, to have them as our clients. So we're able to help connect those dots with them. So, so Eugene, and um, my question to you is, Eugene, um, what are what were the first steps that you took with with Nabedsi? Um, the first step uh, that we took was uh, reaching out to see what type of services they can help us with. Um, and then we sat down with Peter, um, who's an awesome guy, and uh, kind of, like you said, laid out our, uh, you know, our process and what we were looking to do. And um, he has uh, helped us out with uh, relationships, um, like Karen said, uh, with the Indian tribes uh, out actually out here in Nevada. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, those talks kind of slowed down. So we're hoping to get those ramped back up this year. Um, and yeah, just getting us into spaces that a lot of other companies can't get into otherwise. And, and I, don't, I don't, don't know if you said this to the audience, how long have you been working with Peter for, Peter and Karen for? Um, Peter, what, three years? Two About and a half years, years, three years? Three years. Oh, great. So, so let me ask you guys then both, and, and Karen or Peter, you can answer this question first, is what would be, Peter and Karen, for people that should be reaching out to you, what would be like the top three things they should think about, about the Betsy and say, wait, we should call Peter and Karen? Number one, if you're looking, if you are looking to even get started in any type of business industry, I would say connect with us. If you're so looking, industry agnostic then, correct? Industry agnostic. Perfect. We are open to absolutely everyone. We help everyone. Um, the other thing too is capital. We know all businesses need money. That's why we have this cannabis investment forum today. They need money. Um, the other thing is those connections and those relationships. That's one thing that our office is known for is knowing how to connect those dots to different industry professionals. Even by way of you, by way of our, our partner here, Roderick with us today, just utilizing those different relationships so we can help connect the dots. So those are our top three things that we can do. Okay, great. And, and Eugene and Giovanni, uh, what would you like to add on top of that as well too, if anything that Karen just said? Uh, for us, what I think I would like to add is that uh, working with Nabessi, uh, it has given us an opportunity, like my business partner said, to get into those opportunity zones and speak with these tribal leaders on another level. Uh, especially in Arizona, we all know like kind of like the, the casino industry is dying in Arizona. It's not a whole lot of it. Uh, so with those people, they have to figure out other ways to generate revenue uh, and coming into their area, uh, being able to provide a quality product that can either help with uh, quality building materials, uh, educating them on uh, the uses of cannabis and the uses of hemp and what it can all do uh, as far as making affordable building material, hemp creek, concrete, whatever is something that they can uh, definitely grasp onto and make money outside of the casino industry. Uh, and at the same time, we can provide services to other Arizonians that may be looking for job, assisting with inmates coming out of prison and stuff like that. It's just a wide range of us trying to help everyone around us and, su and succeed at the best. Great. Now we, we do have about eight minutes left and in uh, Nabetsi, I, I probably is a very new concept to a lot of people on this call and at this event right now. It's also probably new to a lot of investors and accredited investors that we have here listening. So, so Karen and Peter, um, I'd like to give you the floor for the next three or four minutes to really talk more about Nabetsi, how people can find you, interact with you, how you can deal with investors as well too. So I, I'd like to kind of give you an open forum for three or four minutes and then I'll cut you off because I'll have one last question for everyone, right? Okay, I definitely, we definitely appreciate that. So the first way to get a hold of us is by our website, nabedc.com. So www.nabedc.com has all of our information on there. Specifically on the investor side, for those who are looking to invest and they want to, you know, they can come to us, we can help again, make those different connections to the people that we're working with. Right now, currently we're working with the company that does Humate. So that's a natural fertilizer, so we can get them connected. Um, Peter, you want to add on to that? Yeah, the, the Humate is actually something that uh, NASA is going to be using to uh, send up to the moon. Um, 
It's, it's a natural fertilizer. It comes from the coal uh, part of it. Um, and it comes out of the Navajo Nation uh, in New Mexico. Other services, and you mentioned them earlier on, you know, we, we have our, of course, our elevator pitches, everybody. So I'll, I'll kind of tone it down just a little bit. But again, back to the money, back to the wraparound services. We even assist with marketing, helping with websites, um, helping with e getting emails set up. And we're going to talk to our friends here in a second about that as well. But we just want to make sure that our clients are always putting their best foot forward. Our overarching goal, if you will, is economic development, all these different communities that we're serving. So at the end of the day, you know, if you have someone who is, you know, um, like, our, like our clients here who are, you know, with cannabis and everything else, we want to make sure that we get packaging people involved, artists involved, website developers involved. We want to get as many people involved to help that company. We believe you cannot do things on your own. It takes a community to lift everybody up. So that's pretty much our philosophy within the Betsy. And again, we do serve, you know, our American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiians, but we serve all minorities because essentially at the end of the day, we're all helping each other. And, and Karen, I don't think you said it. How many years has Nabetsi been around for? We've only been around for two years since 2019. And so my background kind of mirrors Peter's a little bit in that I also come from a government background. So I used to work for a, a Governor Napolitano's, one of her projects in Arizona. Um, so, I mean, we, we come from a very unique background in terms of business development services. So I've been doing business and professional development services for more than 25 years now. Great. And, I, and, and I've been working with uh, under grants with the Minority Business Development Agency for about 13 years now. And if, if I'm correct, um, you, you all help people uh, all throughout all 50 states. That's correct. That is correct. Excellent. And now uh, we, we do have a couple minutes left. And, and Eugene and Giovanni, for if you all been working with Peter and Karen for a while, could you please talk about the experience you've had or uh, any words of encouragement for back. other listeners here oh, today, gosh. other people that are trying that need the help of of Nabetsi. Could you could you give some 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 a little bit of insight, maybe some words of encouragement? Yeah. Uh, so that'd be great. Yeah, uh, working with Nabetsi, one thing that we've learned uh, as partners is that uh, you got to have all your I's dotted and your T's crossed when you come to Nabetsi. Uh, you have to have a plan of attack. Uh, you can't go in it blindly. Uh, you have to know where you want to execute, where you want to, what areas you want to touch, and what you need them to do. So you have to have a concise plan so that you can direct uh, Nabetsi as to what you need. And I think me and my business partner, ourselves, we've, we've kind of put it in their hands with helping us with getting into these uh, meetings with uh, tribal uh, leaders and stuff like that, which has been a very insightful because then we get to learn about what their struggles are, what their pain points are, uh, and then where we can come in to alleviate those pain points and try to generate revenue for them and their people as well. You want to touch on it a little bit? Yeah, no, just to kind of piggyback off that, um, like Giovanni said, uh, they've opened up doors, um, you know, that no one else can open up. So um, we're pretty much one of one in the industry right now because we're the only ones that are backed by a uh, government agency like this. So it's pretty rare to have an agency like this to, uh, you know, to have your back. And, and uh, we're very grateful for the relationship that we've uh, created with them. And, and I will say just for myself, as an investor and as someone that represents many investors, um, I think this is great and I'm happy y'all were here today because never heard of Betsy, didn't know that was even around. Um, and at our, own, at our own company, UCS Advisors, we, we do get a lot of phone calls um, for, for people that need help, need assistance, and looking for, for other programs that can assess, uh, help them assess them. And what I'm hearing a lot is also a lot, of, kind of like Karen and Peter, you guys are doing also a lot of mentorship. Which Absolutely. Is so That's... important in this industry. Um, I know we only have two minutes left. So the first thing I'm going to say is please make sure you put your information in the chat room. Okay. Okay. Please make sure people can see that. I saw a few people pop up asking for last names, asking for contact information. Also, please make sure you check the question and answer because I believe there's one or two questions already popped up for y'all. Okay. And with that being said, Karen and Peter, for the last 90 seconds, the floor is yours. What is the, the lasting message you want to leave the audience here today? 
a lasting message. Come to us for all business development services. That's the lasting message. We can provide connections and wraparound services. We don't pretend to know everything, but like I said earlier, we have those connections so we can help people, um, you know, make sure that they get connected in industry. So we would appreciate it if you have any questions whatsoever about business development, specifically even now in the cannabis industry and what we can do to provide services, wraparound support for you, let us know. And we'll be sure to make sure we answer. I see all the questions too, and um, we'll certainly put all of our information in there. And then uh, Eugene and Giovanni, you have any, any last parting words for the audience at all? Uh, yeah, I mean, we need money. <laughs> we need investment money. <laughs> well, well, I will say this, and I'm going to take a message out of John Demanic, and I'm going to take a message from Matt Norgren, is that remember, you need to be prepared. And what we tell Definitely. all our clients here at UCS Advisors, failure to plan is planning to fail. Definitely. And you really need to always think those three or four steps ahead. Peter and Karen, thank you so much. And thank you for introducing this entire crowd of over 250 plus participants to let them be educated about Nevetsi. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you uh, very much. Midwest Buds, wishing you all the best of luck. Keep, keep up the good work. And that wraps up the end of our panel selection.